Turn your Bible, if you will, please, to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Two verses in particular that we want to look at this afternoon in just uh, our time together. The seventh verse, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, what does it say? We have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanseth us from all sin. Drop down to verse nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to begin by saying that it is the blood. We sang about the blood of Jesus today. It's the blood that provides the cleansing. All the cleansing that we need is provided by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. I like the song that says that it will never lose its power. The blood of Christ will never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. So the blood of Jesus that was shed so long ago still is efficacious, still has the power not only to cleanse, but to cleanse all sin. In our study in John chapter 13, in our morning message, we saw that Jesus distinguishes in the 10th verse between being washed and wash. Okay? That's a very important distinction that I want you to remember. The title that I've given this message this time together is Coming Clean with God. Coming clean with God. Because I don't know about you, you're probably like me. There are times when I really feel dirty. That is, I feel like my heart's not clean. How do you come clean with God? How do you have your, your how can you know that you have a clean heart? You can know that. You can have confidence. Can you know you're saved? Absolutely. And if you can know you're saved, the same way you can know you're saved is the way that you can know that you have a clean heart. And so that's what we want to speak of. First of all, to have a clean, to have a clean heart, it requires that you're washed, that you have had a spiritual bath. That is, you're saved. When you're born again, you're washed. And so that's the first cleansing. That's something that happened in the past. You note in John 13, 10, he says, but ye are washed, past tense. When you're saved, you're washed spiritually. But then he says, regarding the symbolism involved in him washing his disciples' feet, but I have to wash you, present tense, cleansing. You need to stay clean with God. Yes, legally, when you're saved, you're cleansed once and for all. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. In whom we have redemption by the shedding of his blood, we are told in the scripture. All sin, past, present, and future, the moment you're saved, you're washed from that. You're cleansed from that. But present tense, foot washing type uh, cleansing, Present tense cleansing is for fellowship with the Lord. That's what verse 7 in 1 John 1 tells us. It's not legal cleansing, but it's practical cleansing. It's about your daily walk with the Lord, your fellowship with him. Only God can enable you to have a clean heart. And so we want to look at that. How? What's involved? You want a clean heart today? Let's see what God says. Before we do, let's pause and pray. Heavenly Father, we would uh, really be, <clears throat> we would be wrong if we just jumped into the scripture without really looking to you. This is your word. And it can't merely be understood on a human level. We need 
the enlightenment, the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit. So open the, the heart to what you have to say to us today. Work mightily. Thank you that we can know that our hearts are cleansed. And I pray that we'd leave here today with that understanding and with that being a reality. We say that and want that to the glory of Jesus, in whose name we ask it. Amen. So, you feel like your heart's dirty, polluted today. What does it take to have a clean heart? Well, let's focus in as we begin on what verse 7 says. <clears throat> May I just remind you, the book of 1 John, that little letter, it's five short chapters, it was written to believers. There is a uh, constant uh, emphasis that this is a book written to believers. And it reveals to us here what, uh, how to come clean with God. How to know that you have a clean heart before the Lord. How to know it. Look at verse 7 with me. Here is a condition. It's uh, the word if. But if there's a condition to having a clean heart, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, because there is a condition that is laid down here in this verse about having a heart clean before God, it means that having a clean heart isn't something that just automatically happens. It's not automatic. There is a certain condition that we as Believers have to meet. What is that condition? Look at it. Again, verse 7. But if we, what? Walk in the light. If we will walk in the light as he as, as he is in the, the light. Now, remember verse 5? Verse 5 says about God, God is light. In him is no darkness at all. So we get the definition of what it means to walk in the light. If God is light and has no darkness, then it means God is holy. So if we walk in God's light as he is holy, then we will meet the condition. And if we do so, notice what the promise is in that seventh verse. We have fellowship one with another. Meet the condition, walk in the light, and as a result, you'll have communion. That is, with the Lord. You'll have fellowship with Him. The promise is connected with the condition. Fellowship is based upon walking in the light. Now, when it says fellowship one with another, it's not talking in the context about my fellowship with you and your fellowship with me is talking about the believer's fellowship with God. If we walk in the light, God is light. And if we walk in the light, then that enables us to have fellowship vertically. That enables us to have fellowship with the Lord. Now, you and I both know, there is no human being that perfectly walks in the light. Right? We don't always walk in the light. So, how in the world can we walk in the light? Because if you take just the tiniest step into darkness, the fellowship with the Lord, you don't lose your relationship with him. You don't need to be washed. You need to wash. You need to have that foot washed. You need to be cleansed. So how could you do it? Well, look at verse 9. Because here again is a conditional clause. See it? But it's followed by a promise, and that promise is really in two steps. And we'll look at it, take it apart. Verse 9, if, there's the condition, if we confess our sins, that's the condition there. There is, the first condition is that of confession. If we confess our sins, well, let's talk about that for a moment. The word confess there in the ninth verse simply means to say the same, 
It means to call our sin the same thing God says it is, to be in agreement with God, to call it the same thing that God who is light, God who is holy calls it. So to confess, to say the same thing about our sin God says about it, means that we have to we have to confess our sin accurately. By that I mean you have to call sin what it is. You have to identify it for what it really is. I think confessing it carries with it the idea of actually naming it. Naming that sin. Not trying to sidestep it and ignore it or gloss over it or sugarcoat it. Not calling it a mistake. You know, God, I've made a mistake. Or a lot of sins today get called diseases, right? For instance, they call the disease of alcoholism. The Bible never calls it that. The Bible calls it the sin of drunkenness, not the disease of alcoholism. And so to confess is to speak accurately about our sin. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 tells us that our human heart is desperately wicked, and we ourselves don't know it. Okay, if we don't know our heart, then how in the world can we say what God says about it? How can we agree with him and confess it? Well, the next verse says, I, the Lord, search the heart. And so we depend upon God to reveal to us anything that is sinful. And if you're and if you are in tune with the Lord, he'll tell you it right away. He won't wait till the end of the day and say, "Hey, uh, by the way, you know, earlier in the day you said something that was not right and you need to no, the moment that you sin, God seeks to correct you. Don't let it build up. Don't think that the end of the day, before you pop off to sleep, you say, and Lord, forgive me for all of my sins, that that's confession. That's not confession. That's meaningless. That's just words. Confession is to say it accurately, which is to identify what that sin is. When you see your sin as God sees your sin, only then will you be able to say what God says about your sin. You got to see it through his eyes in order to say what he says. To confess is to say the same that God says about your sin. So confession is to speak accurately about sin, your sin. Secondly, to confess is to to say thoroughly what your sin is. Get to the point. I mean, fully recognize and acknowledge your sin. Be totally honest before God because if you're incomplete in confessing your sin, your spiritual life is going to be stymied. That's not confession. So be thorough about it. Don't uh, don't just be halfway in dealing with your sin. Be all in on owning up to it. Accurately, thoroughly. And then another aspect of confessing is when you do, be honest. Do it honestly. Don't make excuses for why you sin. Uh, Don't try to justify yourself in any way by saying, well, you know why I did this? It's because you did that. Or, you know why I did this? It's just my personality. It's just the way I'm wired. Or, It's my nationality. I'm Irish, and Irish have bad tempers and so forth. No, be honest, or it's not really confession of sin. Don't blame other people for your sin. You know, when you're, for instance, if you're really getting right on a horizontal level with another person, you're coming and you're wanting their forgiveness, you know what you do? You don't go up to them and say, you know, would you please forgive me for such and such? But, you know, if you wouldn't have said that, I wouldn't have reacted like that. That's not forgiveness. That's not asking for forgiveness. 
And we don't do that with God either when we confess. We don't blame others. Uh, we, we don't blame our circumstances. Well, you know, it was just the situation that I found myself in. I just lost my head. Honestly, confession of sin accurately, thoroughly, and honestly. And then here's another one. They all end with L L Y permanently. What do I mean by that? Writer of Proverbs says this. Whoever covers his sin will not prosper, but he that confesseth, get this, and forsaketh it shall find mercy. In other words, when you confess sin, you're not just confessing guilt. You have a guilty conscience, not just confessing a guilt feeling, but you're confessing the sin itself because you don't want it anymore. Deep down, you hate it and you want to be delivered from it. You want to give it up. You want to let it go. You don't want to hold on to it any longer. You know, I think sometimes in our so-called confessing sin, we're not really confessing it. We're playing a tug of war with God. We feel we, we have a guilty feeling. And so we ask the Lord to forgive us for what we just did with no intention of stopping it. And it's not until we let go of the of the other end of the of the rope and stop playing the tug of war with God and and we want him to win. We want him to take this to deliver us from it whatever it might be, whatever sin it might be. You know, Paul says in Romans 13 that we should walk in the light, we should put on the armor of light. We should not make provision for our flesh to fulfill its lust. So get rid, you know, if if you want deliverance from a sin, then get rid of all the paraphernalia that uh, that pertains to it. Get rid of all of the things that uh, that lead up to it that make it easy for you to fall into that sin. Don't put yourself deliberately in a place of temptation if you really are confessing it. You want to get rid of it permanently. You know, it's like the the guy that. He got saved and he, he had a uh, swearing problem and he wanted to be, he, he hated, he, he, he knew that that wasn't right and he wanted to, to not swear anymore, but he didn't hate it enough to ask God to deliver him from it. And so found himself always falling into the same, he's playing tug of war with God. You got to hate it. And God, I want deliverance from I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to fall into the same sin all the time. Stop making provision. Confess it permanently. Let it go of it. Don't just confess the guilt that you feel, but the sin that you've participated in. And then one final thing, what it means to confess. To confess accurately, to confess thoroughly, to confess uh, honestly, uh, to confess permanently, and one more. Sometimes it ne it's necessary to confess relationally. What does that mean? You have to make it right with people sometimes. You have to make it right with the person that knows about your sin or the person that you've sinned against. Uh, the person that knows you need to make it right with them. Simple as that. For instance, listen to this. This is Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount. This is what Jesus says in verse 23 and 24. If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there at the altar, you remember your brother has aught against you, then leave your gift before the altar, go your way, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. If there is someone that you need to get right with, then you must do that because it will hinder your walking in the light. It will hinder your ability to live for God. In fact, I think one of the greatest hindrances that I've read about and experienced to God really working in a congregation and an assembly of people like this is 
that there is relational rifts between people that need to be getting that need to be got right with them as well as with the Lord. It's a great hindrance. Okay. So that's the condition that he gives there in that ninth verse. If we confess our sin, and now I've gone into great detail as to what it means to confess your sin. But now the second step is not only confession, but confidence. Because he says, if we confess our sin, he, God, he is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So confession has to also carry with it confidence in God. A faith that is based upon his promise. If you'll confess, I'll do this. You can have confidence in him. You must have confidence. You must depend upon God because of his character. Look at who he is. He's faithful every time you really confess. He's faithful to forgive and to cleanse. He's just. That's what the Bible says. That means that's a, a legal term. God is a God of justice. You know, in this country, we're finding out more and more there is a two-tiered justice system. Some people get preferential treatment, and uh, maybe they will escape punishment while the book is thrown at another person for the same crime, right? God's not like that. God is just. And when God says that he will, if you'll confess, forgive you, he's faithful and he is a just God and will do exactly what he says. He's the just judge and he says, if you'll confess, I will totally acquit you. I'll put a non guilty verdict on your life. Now, look at the, the threefold promise that we have here uh, regarding the confidence of, of uh, that we have in the Lord. He says, if we confess our sins, verse 9, he's faithful and just, first of all, to forgive us. To forgive is to release. To forgive is to release someone from a debt and to send away from what's owed. That's what forgiveness really is. When God forgives, he releases you from the debt that you owe. You're a debtor. You're a sinner. When you sin, you owe God a debt. And that debt is released when you confess that sin. God sends away that debt that you owe. And he does that because his blood has satisfied that debt. That was the price. And his blood that he shed on that cross satisfied fully the debt that your sin owed God. And so based upon his shed blood, he can release you from the debt that you, you really owe. You justly owe. But he, the just one, he paid the price in your place through his shed blood. And so he can release you. Forgiveness is... Re you know, when you forgive someone, you're releasing them from the debt that you think or that they do owe to you. You're releasing them. You're not holding them in debt to you any longer. You're letting it go. You, you know, I was just talking yesterday with someone about the fact that one of the greatest hindrances in the Christian life is people, older and younger people, that have not forgiven people that have mistreated them, abused them, whatever you want to call it. They haven't forgiven them. Well, you say, well, they haven't come to me and repented and asked for my forgiveness. That's a different kind of forgiveness, okay? I'm talking about forgiving them in your heart, releasing them from the debt that they owe you in your heart. If you don't do that, young people, listen to me. Old, older people probably are already experiencing it or have experienced. If you don't forgive them, you know what? It's going to drive you nuts. It's going to bring you to the place where you are so bothered by it, you're going to get, you're going to, your anger is going to build. It's going to become bitterness within you. And you know, bitterness never ends well. It leads to suicide. A lot of 
depressed people are bitter about some circumstance that either they blame a person for or God or both. And they get bitter in their heart and then life loses its meaning. And so it's dangerous. Please release people that sin against you. Release them from it. Even though they don't deserve. That's what we don't deserve God's release, right? We don't deserve God's forgiveness, but we're to release others just as by that as God has released us on the basis that we don't deserve it. They don't deserve it, but because you didn't deserve it and God released you, release them, will you? Otherwise, you're not hurting them. You're killing yourself. You're poisoning yourself. You're poisoning yourself unless you release that wife, unless you release that husband, unless you release that parent. Unless you release that uh, former friend or whoever, that boss, whoever did you wrong, release them. That's what Jesus does for us when we confess. He releases us. But not only that, he goes a step further. He removes it. See what it says in verse 9? Not only to forgive, but to cleanse from all unrighteousness. He releases us from the debt of our sin when we confess, and then he removes it. His blood is the basis for washing us clean, washing our heart, our conscience, all of it. He removes, he purges the, the guilt and the sin. It's forever gone. That's what it means. And then there's a third thing, and that's in verse 7. When we confess our sin... You can be confident. You can you have faith in God's promise that he'll not only release, he'll forgive. Not only will he remove, he'll cleanse, but he'll restore. Verse 7 says, and you'll have fellowship with God. You'll have fellowship one with another. He restores a contrite heart to a place of fellowship with him. That's the provision. That's the promise. The provision, though, it's there, it's promised, but it does you no good if you don't take advantage of it. If you don't believe it. Or if you believe it in your head and you don't actually claim it. It's just like knowing that you're saved is based on faith in the promise of God, right? He said, uh, he says that... Um, What's John 1, 12? Um, but as many as received him, to them gave the power to become the sons of God, even though they don't believe on his name. So by faith, you receive Jesus and you're born again, right? In the same way, by faith, you receive this promise of cleansing and you'll have God's, you'll know God's forgiveness. When the conditions are met and the conditions are simple, we confess our sin if we walk in the light. When the conditions are met, then the provision is given. But the provision just sitting there on the table unless you walk up to the table, so to speak, and you take it personally and you claim it as God's gift, what he's promised, regardless of how you feel, you take it. So don't listen to Satan's lies because he lies and he will build unbelief and you won't believe God's promise. Even though you've confessed, you say, I don't feel like it. Well, regardless of how you feel, this is what God says. And if you don't believe it, you'll spiral. You'll spiral downward. So it's so important. Have you stepped into a walking in the light is there something that you're hiding that you need to get right with god have you accurately have you thoroughly and in all honesty come clean with god is there something that you need to forgive clear the air with god or with someone else as well you'll never have real fellowship with the lord until you come totally clean with him and I'm telling you, when, you're, when you believe what God says, when you confess, and 
meet the condition and take his promise. There's no greater feeling in, in all of life to know that you have a clean heart. And God wants that for every single one of us. He wants that for all of his people. And there's no reason why you and I can't have it. Just simple conditions. If we walk in the light, okay, that means I'm looking to God. I'm looking to him to direct me. I, I want to do what he wants me to do. And when I don't, then I walk in darkness. What do I do? I confess. I own it fully. And when I do, there's full forgiveness. And I don't have to walk around with a guilty conscience anymore. That's purged. That's cleansed. I'm free. I'm released. Does that make sense? So, any questions? Or, or Have you experienced this? Isn't it a blessing if you've experienced a clean heart? This is what God wants for you. You should take him up on it. Any thoughts?